We're sitting here with Michael Klein and Janella Chin of Cannabis MD and God's Greenery. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. I want to start by kind of getting a little bit of background on you and how you came into the cannabis space. And then I want to talk about your background with cannabis and how the company's formed and where we see them going. So you, Michael, were the executive <clears throat> president of Condé Nast or MTV. Tell us a little bit about your history in the media. Sure. Yeah, no, my background is in digital content and television. Uh, prior to coming to Miracula, which is our B2B name for Cannabis MD and God's Greenery, I was head of original content uh, at MTV across all platforms. Um, before that, I uh, went to Condé Nast and uh, launched a new division called Condé Nast Entertainment that was taking the IP from the legendary print publications of Vogue and Air GQ, etc., uh, to other platforms, feature films, television, and digital content. So I had launched the TV division, and then a few months later took oversight of a, a digital division, uh, which was really creating you know, storytelling on video and syndicating it to a, a broad audience. Let's talk about Miraculo? Miraculo. Miraculo, okay. Miraculo, Latin for miracle. Okay, so tell us a little bit about that and what kind of companies you could see being in that portfolio. Sure. So Miraculo is a data and technology company, media company. Uh, where our goal is to discover underserved audiences within medical cannabis and CBD, create a great content experience for them, and build those communities. Mm -hmm. Cannabis MD is our first vertical, which is a non-advocacy platform. Non-advocacy meaning potential benefits of medical cannabis and CBD. We don't have a bias towards use. Our goal is to show all the positive research, positive first-person accounts, and the not-so-positive research, not-so-positive first-person accounts, the goal being to empower consumers to make choices that are right for them. Mm -hmm. The second platform is God's Green Ring, which uh, we found this, this growing wave online of Christians talking about CBD as God's gift of healing. So nothing to do with medical cannabis and nothing to do with THC. Hemp derived CBD is God's gift of healing and building a community around that for education. You know, it's really interesting. I haven't come across very many religious or, you know, religious affiliated organizations out there. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, Kosher Kush earlier before the interview, and, and, and that is actually making a wave. You know, some people might think that in certain religious um, groups that cannabis is taboo, and, you know, that it would be hard for them to accept it given the years of uh, it being in the closet. So you're saying that you, that there was a, a need for cannabis in the Christian community or, or yeah, positive well, representation or how did that really come to fruition? Yeah, what we found is that Christians didn't have a place to talk about it and to learn about it. So when we actually announced that company, you know, I had the same feeling like, oh gosh, there may be some resistance here that can do it. Nothing. What was more about, oh, thank you. <laughs> because Christians were using CBD, we probably get more resistance on cannabis MD with down to the basics of does CBD make you high, mm -hmm. and you know that's sort of an associated stigma around it. It's really really interesting. And so, what is your history with cannabis? How did you come into the industry? Yeah, so you know I was approached about this from a we're backed by a venture capital company uh, who I literally hired a headhunter, and uh, I received a phone call one day about it, and. For me, I'm always interested in something that's driving cultural conversation. You know, entertainment, when you create a hit television series, you identify the consumer need, you're rewarded with an audience. You know, Conde Nast, driving cultural conversation and being part of that. So as I looked across cannabis, one, we're at this moment in history where an entirely new category is born. Uh, two, when I looked across the digital landscape, I found that there were any number of platforms that had launched but they were all speaking to an adult consumption audience, somebody who had a relationship with cannabis. Nobody was owning that authority voice, in the case of Cannabis MD, of a non-advocacy point of view. And I thought, that's really interesting. The cannabis curious and CBD curious audience is the growing audience. You know, if 15% of the population have a relationship right now in some form, it's the other 85% that we can talk to. Mm -hmm. And so given your history in the media, how has that transcend over into cannabis? How do you feel like you stand above the other voices in the industry and in trying to, you know, be that good too? Yeah. Well, I don't want to stand above necessarily more of a clear lane. You know, I think of it that way. 
For me, it's taking my experience, frankly, uh, you know, of storytelling, telling in the premium way, being authentic, you know, all of the traits that have fueled my career. You know, when you think about digital media, it's a race to the bottom to scale, for the most part. You know, it's like, you know, this, you know, this funny stupid cat video that is the one that gets a bazillion views, versus do something meaningful, tell a meaningful story, and, you know, that resonates with, with audiences in some way. And so it's applying all of those rules to the cannabis space. Mm -hmm. For me personally, my relationship with cannabis was really more with family members who were using it in sort of a palliative care. My father, years ago, called me. He said, "I'm gonna I think I'm gonna try medical marijuana," as he called it. And uh, I said, "I think that's a great idea." He was battling, you know, like it's like a buffet of medications he was on. And so he went to his doctor. He lived in Canada, got a prescription, and then it was then what? You know, and it's like so for travel or sorry. Uh, uh, health advisor from afar, I'm, you know, I go on to Google, and it's like TripAdvisor. You have no idea if anything's authentic, is it real, is it credible, is it written by Jason in the dispensary? And sure enough, you know, he had to go see Jason in the dispensary, who some 22-year-old kid is giving my you know, eight-year-old father vape for morning and vape for night. Wow. He never slept better, but it, it always stuck with me. I'm like, mm. Right, and there is a lot of counterfeit products on the market now. There's a lot of snake oil out there. Uh, you know, you can probably get a couple, of, like, uh, in California, someone had done a study, I forgot the group, but they had tested 10 CBD products just from general stores around the neighborhood, and I think like 40% four of the 10 products had nothing in them. Um, and then I also read on your website that you guys have partnered with uh, Lab 21? Think 20 Labs. Think 20 Labs, yes. okay. Yep. So can you tell us a little bit about the importance behind partnering with the lab, and this might be for you, Dr. Chin. Um, you know, how did you come to decide that that was the lab you wanted to work? What made them stand above the rest? I think the most important part are lab standards. You know, there's a lot of labs uh, that are popping up and opening up in the CBD and cannabis craze, uh, just like there are products. And to make sure that a lab is GMP certified, that it has certain standards to measure products um, in the cannabis space is very, very important because not all labs are alike. Right, not all labs are alike. Hmm. Or test equal, I'd say. Exactly. Um, and so, where are they located? In New York? They're located in Massachusetts? No, they're at Irvine, California. Okay. And, and in uh, Columbia, Maryland. Maryland. Um, they take lab testing really to the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we, you know, when we had to, we made the decision to offer CBD products on Canvas MD. And the reason for that is you know, thanks to, to June and our medical advisors of educating consumers, we're coming from that, that CBD curious consumer, from that moment of curiosity through their journey of discovery, and ultimately to a conversion or not, of like, maybe I should try this. Well, then we were sending them into the Wild West right. and to that clutter and confusion in the bodega down the street. Yeah, and so we thought, how can we do this in a way to maintain our non-advocacy position? And that's where the discussion of finding the right lab came into play. We identified about 34 products uh, based on consumer feedback, um, uh, from what we could see online, etc., tested them so that we could actually confirm that what they said was in the bottle was true. Less than 50% we were able to actually determine that what they said was true. And do you think that that's through deliberate lying, or do you think that they maybe just didn't know? I think it, part of it is I think Think 20's process just goes that much deeper. Mm -hmm. you know, these are brands that are familiar. Mm -hmm. um, well, with white labeling going on, you know, if, if you don't get COAs or certificate of analysis with those products, then you know you're really just going off a of belief, and it's about doing the due diligence all the way back to the manufacturer. So that's right. That's right. And, and not listen. many companies know how to do that. And not many companies yeah. either they don't know, or, or unfortunately, it's it's a quick bang, it's a quick you know buck in this industry. Like, how can I get in, cash out, and then get out? Um, and then that unfortunately hurts the rest of us in the industry that are trying to make a name and are trying to make cannabis reputable. And you know we're dealing with, with people that um, are just in it for the money. Say. Right, and when I'm teaching patients on even how to read a COA, when I look at these COAs, some of them are so old, they're so dated, they're not accurate. Mm -hmm. So just because some companies have a COA and they put it on their website or reference a link, that doesn't mean that the COA is authentic. Itself. And how often should people be asking for COAs? You should be looking at the most recent batch of COAs, and that should be provided. There should be transparency in the brand and transparency with the lab as well. Mm -hmm. And so enter Cannabis MD. Can you tell us a little bit about how you two met and how you came on to Cannabis MD and God's Greenery? 
For me, I've been in the cannabis space uh, as a physician uh, for 15 years. I started in California in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and I was introduced because of my own health condition. Um, an HIV and AIDS physician introduced me to cannabis. Um, I have uh, what's called ankylosing spondylitis, which is an autoimmune disease of the spine. Um, no cure, uh, really it's just palliative care. And for me, it was an inflection point in medical school, it was either drop out of medical school or try something else. Um, and this physician from UCSF said, you know, my HIV and AIDS patients use it, cannabis uh, is just legalized medically in California, you should give it a try. And from that point on- Great doctor. I know, from that point on, I decided to build my career in helping patients integrate cannabis medicine safely. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, step one is, is literally probably explaining what cannabinoids are, I would imagine. Could you, for the audience, explain what a cannabinoid is? So a cannabinoid comes from our own body uh, called the endocannabinoid system. So we all make cannabis-like molecules in our body, but it also comes from the plant, from the cannabis plant called phytocannabinoids. So our body either makes our own or we can get it from the plant. And the plant can provide great medicinal benefits. Um, and there's different cannabinoids in the plant. CBD and THC is what's researched most widely, but there's other cannabinoids that are being discovered every day. And so when cannabis is consumed, it activates the receptor of the CB1, mm -hmm. uh, which can be attributed to the munchies. Yep. And so can CBD reduce appetite or can it increase appetite? We know THC typically has been known to lead to food consumption. Is there anything on the opposite end of that spectrum that people, because we hear that some CBD might be able to reduce appetite, help for dieting. Is that true? Do you know if that's true? Is more research needed? Um, clinically speaking, I know um, cannabinoids such as THC will work on what's called leptin and ghrelin hormones, which are our hunger hormones. But what CBD does, it decreases anxiety and calms our nervous system. And what I have found clinically is that patients don't overeat. Patients that are much calmer, that feel less anxious, don't reach for that pint of ice cream. And uh, you know, maybe indirectly, they'll, they'll lose weight or they won't gain weight. Mm -hmm. Have you been a part of any research studies that are coming out? Are you involved with any universities and, and creating any studies? We know much more research is needed in this industry. I am. I'm involved in two clinical trials right now. I'm not at liberty to okay. um, disclose, but they are for the universities. <laughs> <laughs> so recently, maybe like in the summertime, an article had come out about CBD and blood thinners. What can you say on that, or what can you say CBD may not, uh, should not be taken with? Is there any sort of advice you might be able to give? I actually, I can't say that it's a contraindication, meaning you can take CBD when you're on blood thinners. You just want to make sure that your doctor is monitoring your lab levels and monitoring your other medications. So you might not need as much of the blood thinner, you might need half the dose, mm -hmm. and, and that's the beauty of you know, patients finding physicians such as myself uh, or the other physicians on the Cannabis MD Advisory Board is that we as MDs will help you integrate cannabis medicine safely with your other medications. Mm -hmm. So we'll be able to look at the long list of medications, you know, be able to create a game plan, when to take the cannabis medicine, when to take the prescriptions, when you should go back to the doctor, and then what lab tests should be monitored. And your role with Cannabis MD is you oversee all the content that's published in addition to being on the advisory board, do you have a much more hands-on role with the website itself? It's a team approach. Okay. It's a team approach and we all look at the content, we create content, uh, we do interviews. Gosh, um, we, some, what other stuff do we do? Mostly interviews, editorial content, yeah. yeah. What I think is interesting about the team as well, you know, and for June, when she tells the story, I saw her on the panel is where we first, we first connected Ooh. at the World Cannabis Congress. Oh New my York. gosh, that was in Jacob Javits? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, but you, she told the story of, sort of her journey to cannabis, but it was actually it was pretty funny too, because you were talking about the fact of your own stigma yeah. around it. Yeah. yeah, my own stigma. I grew up in an Asian family, Chinese family. My mother believed that cannabis led to schizophrenia, and that's what I was taught. My mother thought that too. My grandfather had schizophrenia and he used to smoke cannabis and, and that was one of the things that she said, well, she said a lot of things about cannabis, but I, you know, I mean, I don't know if that's true. Has any research come out on schizophrenia and cannabis? No, there's no, right. no correlation, doesn't equal causation. Um, 
But back to your point of the whole team of, of cannabis and the board advisors, I mean, we come from all different specialties. Yeah. Um, you know, there are specialties oncologists, there's dentists, there's podiatrists. Um, veterinarians. Veterinarians. <laughs> there's nurses, nurse practitioners as well. Yeah. So it's really a healthcare provider approach, and we all contribute our specialty um, into the cannabis MD platform. But I would say there's no collusion with this group either. Mm -hmm. you know, there can be there can be varying opinions mm -hmm. uh, based on you know, frontline experience uh, and research, with them, which I love. Yeah. I love. You know, there's a, there's like sometimes can be attention like, well, what if we don't all agree? It's like, great. That's the reality of the category right now. Unless we have you know conclusive research that's being done. And I assume that some of the topics might even come from, you know, um, things that the board members experience individually, you know, with patients. Uh, for example, my grandparents are 90 years old, and my grandmother, I've, I've been giving her CBD, and um, she's been telling her doctor, but when she first asked about it, he said, I didn't study that, I don't know, we're not gonna talk about it this time. He completely cut her off. And mm -hmm. so, how do you feel, the overall like medical community, the general physicians of the world, do you feel like it's still the same? They're not picking up cannabis research, or some of them are slowly starting to come into cannabis research. You know, in Texas, for example, only specific doctors can give licenses. A lot of those doctors are apprehensive because they don't want to put themselves in jeopardy. So, what are your thoughts on on the the general medical community coming into cannabis life? It really depends on the state you're in. You know, in California, I think the medical community has embraced it fully, um, and it's integrated in, in, you know, in every patient meeting that you have with your primary care. Um, on the East Coast, a little bit less, um, but when you look at institutions like NYU Langone, Montefiore, Albert Einstein, and they're getting research money from the NIH, from the DOD, to study cannabis and autism, cannabis and Crohn's, cannabis and chronic pain, that's when the, my colleagues will start to look. Mm -hmm. They start to, they say, well, if they got $5 million from the NIH, there must be something there worth studying. Um, and I do grand rounds, I do um, seminars, I do um, noon conferences with my colleagues, my other MD colleagues in, in and around the area. And some of them will, you know, cross and look, you know, like, no, there's no way that cannabis is medicine. And they're usually the older physicians and might have the stigma. Um, but I think some of the, the younger physicians uh, are, are already embracing it. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to ask you, so some of the CBD medicine that has hit the market, the biggest one being Epidiolex. What can you say, I know that that's still seen as um, kind of a medical breakthrough. It was able to get onto the market. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I see a lot of patients that have tried Epidiolex and it didn't work for. Okay. Um, Dr. Davinsky at NYU um, has a trial with Epidiolex. I think the biggest thing is cost. Not all the insurance companies are covering Epidiolex and I think it's upward between 30, 30 grand and higher per year. Do you think it's a good start? It is a good start, especially for the MD community. I think for uh, colleagues, you know, we're a conservative bunch. It's really hard to move the needle, mm -hmm. and if you have a clinical trial, if there's something that we can talk about pharmacokinetics um, of the plant-based medicine, it's a good start. Okay, that's good to hear. So I noticed on Canvas MD, you guys have some products listed on there. Um, not a lot, a few, maybe like half a dozen. What was it about those products specifically that stood out? Perhaps you can speak to that. Yeah, so that, that goes back to our, our partnership with Think20 Labs mm -hmm. um, and testing products. So those are products that we can verify, we can have the data to show that yes, what they say is in the bottle is true in terms of potency of CBD and the fact that it's free of any other contaminants and other, other material. Okay. What is it like operating in an unregulated CBD space? It's a different take every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think for you, it's a little bit different. For, we're reporting. You know, at Cannabis MD, we're reporting. Our goal in everything that we, that we publish is consumer safety. Like how, you know, consu you know, consumer safety first mm -hmm. in everything that we do. Um, so that gives us uh, a lot of permission to, to, to have strong opinions either way. But make sure we're backing them up with authority voices. Like June. Can you tell us the difference between indica and sativa? There is no difference between indica and sativa. 
there um, are multiple chemovars, I don't like to use the name strain, or chemical variants of the cannabis plant, and a lot of them are, are blends, are blends of cannabis and sativa uh, species. Hybrids. Hybrids, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, some of them might be more dominant in certain cannabinoids and terpenes, some might not be. So for example, um, clinically speaking, um, you know, I know that I have a lot of anecdotal clinical evidence that cannabinoids work as a medicine, and a lot of researchers and my counterparts will say, well, this is all anecdotal. There's nothing that you have that's clinically, you know, a clinical trial, a sound study. But really, researchers should be asking is, well, how do we explore these individual data points more closely? Because we've been sitting on this data in California, as you know, for, for two decades, right? So this is something, right? There, it, there really is no precedent to have something that's used both uh, recreationally and medicinally. And so when you're looking at the different uh, chemovars, you're really looking at you know, a, a wide array of botanical medicine. And we have to really think about that, not just about cannabis or sativa, or is it you know, CBD or THC? Do I need 1,000 milligrams of CBD? We're really looking at this as a whole plant-rich formula. And so what, would, what recommendations would you give to someone new, maybe apprehensive about trying CBD? Maybe they're trying to get over the stigma, a senior citizen, for example. What would your recommendations be to them coming into the space for the first time, being a newcomer to CBD? Of course, I always recommend to speak with your doctor. Um, if you can't find a healthcare provider that can, is knowledgeable about cannabis and CBD or THC, then looking at the Cannabis MD website is a great resource. And then you can find other physicians uh, in different parts of the country that can help um, guide you and on, a, on an education basis. I think the most important thing for elderly, for example, is to start slow and slow. Um, there's a lot of terpenes actually that can worsen uh, hot flashes, for example. You know, beta carotene for my menopausal women patients, they will get hot flashes throughout the whole night and actually it doesn't help their insomnia. My Parkinson's patients, when they take CBD regularly, it actually doesn't work long term unless they combine it with intense cardiovascular exercise like boxing. So I found that in clinically speaking. So it's really important to talk to a healthcare provider. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I might do a story on that health flash one you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. That would speak to a lot of our readers. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, I think um, that's pretty much, I mean, of course, I detected the list of questions that we pretty much touch based on all of them. Um, is there anything else in particular you want folks to know about Cannabis ND? I know we didn't talk about God's greenery that much. Um, would you like us to discuss it a little more? We can. Okay. And I think Cannabis, I think with June, Cannabis ND probably makes the most sense. Okay, and, and we did discuss it a little bit in the beginning, yeah, so we'll make sure to touch base yeah. on that. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like people to know uh, about yourselves or about maybe where they can, where will you be next? People like to know if they could, you know, see you. Are you going to be speaking at any conferences coming up? Um, I speak a lot at a lot of conferences. Okay. I, you know, I was just at Yale last week, and then two weeks ago I was at Columbia. So I think more and more um, universities, medical centers are really embracing um, this cannabinoid medicine movement, and it's really a wake-up call to the healthcare system because sites like Cannabis MD, uh, apothecaries, dispensaries, they're really an extension of um, health and wellness. And a lot of patients and consumers are going to these sites and going to these dispensaries because they're providing education. They're providing, uh, I think, a lot more listening than you might get at a seven minute clinic uh, visit with your doctor. Um, and so I think we really have to look closely at CBD and cannabis as a whole for the future of healthcare. Well, I think the whole medical cannabis and CBD category is so fascinating because it, as you said, it touches every demographic. You know, we talk about seniors, but you know, and my mother, for instance, uses a three to one THC cream on balm on her knee that allows her to keep golfing. You know, I mean, three years ago, we would not have that conversation. Uh, and my 21 year old niece is a dancer, uses CBD as part of her recovery. It wasn't, it was like millennials decided CBD was the thing and it took off. It is everywhere. And there's so many different need states for consumers around that. And that's what fuels me around Canvas MP that we have the opportunity to talk to all these different audiences. And as there are more stories from the front lines really, that can surface and help consumers navigate this, and wellness, you know, as a category in and of itself, if you think about um, you know, the you know, debate around healthcare in this country, and consumers are looking for ways to take control of that. Mm -hmm. 
in all aspects of their life. And you know, clearly, CBD and medical cannabis are our rise we'll talk about. Well, and I think that Canvas MD really does excel at creating approachable content. People are very intimidated by terms that they're unfamiliar with, and you know, going through your website and reading some of the stories, um, it's very easy to understand, very easy to navigate and digest. That's great. And so we appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Thank you both so much. This was this was great.